Hi everyone. Thanks for being here. I think thanks, Miguel. That was a great introduction. You just stole the show, but you know. That's <laughs> Um, as uh, Mika was saying, I think I'm, um, I'm an investment director in, in renewable energy and water. I spend a lot of my days uh, looking at how to invest uh, other people's money, including my own. Uh, and I'm here to talk a little bit about money systems. But before we do that, I wanted to take one step back and talk. I heard that this is also a very creative community. So um, the theme for this month was that creativity is in large part a decision. And I think for me that was brilliant because it applies to everything. You wake up every day and you, you, you're not always motivated, but you wake up and every day you create habits to, to create, to build. For me, it's to invest. So it is absolutely the same process that we decide, what do I want from my life? I want to be a good painter, I want to be a good designer, I want to be a good investor. So we make a decision every day um, to do something and to build habits around it so that they are thoughtless. So every day you wake up and you don't think, should I work today or should I not work today? You just build on habits. And I think creating a sustainable world, which I think is the sort of the, the main theme actually around investments today, is the same thing. How do we create habits as good consumers? How do we create habits as good uh, voters in order to elect the right people? to do the right thing. We, you know, as consumers, we probably eat less meat or we fly less. Um, and again, as, as, uh, as political entities, we try and get involved in our communities. And I wanted to talk about a little bit about the third part, which I think is less talked about, is how do money, f where does money flow? How are investors today habitually making things without thinking? And are those creating a sustainable world or are they not creating a sustainable world? I'll come back to this theme, but again, the main idea I want to leave you today with is how do we create healthy habits in all areas of our lives that support a sustainable world that we all want to live in. So, but it is a decision, it is something that you build in, and I think the financial world today has built in habitually decisions that are not leading to sustainable world, and I think that's uh, where I will take this talk to. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the financial world simplified. This is much more complicated. Uh, but in essence, another thing I want to leave you with you today is that every time you hear somebody talk about an investor, you know, the investor Blackstone and these guys and those girls, you know, doing good things or bad things, I want you to remember that's you. That's me and you, right here, right there. You and me every day have savings that, uh, that go into the financial system. They usually go through three main ways. There's lots of other smaller ways, but I, I wanted to kind of keep it clean and simple. You either invest in your homes, you can buy family houses or apartments, you can self-invest. Some people feel they're able, they, they go buy stocks in the public markets. But I would say the majority of us have, how many of you are actually have, have had or have or will have a pension, well, maybe you don't know if you will. How many of you have had or have a pension fund current? So a lot of you. Um, how many of you knew the company that was managing your pension? Right, so fewer. I would say most of it, at least in Denmark, I realize I'm American, but in Denmark, I've worked here for almost five years at two different companies. It's, there's a mandatory public pension fund, so the government takes money every year to put into a public pension fund. There is job pension fund contribution, and I would say most times you don't have a choice. Like when I worked for Vestas, um, I see one of my ex-colleagues here. Um, we, I mean, Vestas had an agreement with the pension fund, and then we just were part of that, a member of that. We didn't have an active choice in selecting it. And, um, and those pension funds, generally, I think I would say it's the largest portion of savings for most people, um, is then they go and invest in banks, they buy stocks in Nordea, they invest in energy, in Vestas, Shell, Total, other companies, Nova Nordisk, um, real estate, the Empire State Building was built with totally other people's our savings, and they also go and buy government bonds. When governments don't have enough taxes, they often uh, get pension funds to invest in their government bonds to, to finance um, expenditures, like building a road or whatever they need. So I think it, it's amazing because I worked in finance for a long time, but it took me a long time to figure out that it was my savings I was managing. I was ma I was, I'm an asset manager. We, I was managing other people's, everyday people's savings. And those numbers are huge. They're $44.1 trillion in 2019 of global savings. And you could see the darker areas are places where there's a, a very high levels of savings. So the US, uh, Canada, you can't see here, but Denmark and the Nordics um, are some of the deepest, they call capital markets in the world with some of the largest savings. Just to have an idea what that means, 
my husband suggested this, thank you, Frank. <laughs> He's like, what does that number even mean? It's basically the equivalent of both the US economy and the European economy combined. The US economy is $21.4 trillion. Your European economy is a bit bigger, yay, $22.9 trillion. To get our savings are basically, our global savings are basically the equivalent um, of two, two of the largest economies in the world. So that's a lot of money. Um, and again, coming back to the decision, how do people who manage those decisions, where do they like to go? Where do they like to invest? Just like all of us, they have their own habits. They eat cereal, they eat eggs in the morning, and they decide oil and gas or, or renewables. Um, they have certain structures and systems in place that make their decisions just as habitual as our decision to eat eggs or cereal. A little bit more sophisticated, but not much more, to be honest. Um, I wanted to also talk a little bit about a little bit of a story, um, so it relates to this. This is Canadian pension funds. Um, I chose them just because they have very good data, but this is very reflective, I would say, of most pension funds in the world, including Danish. I would say between t 10 and 20 percent of the m money that they manage on our behalf goes into fossil fuels. It's lots of technicalities to say they do it in equities or in debt and other instruments, but the but the general number that I've seen is between 10 and 20. And the story I want to say is that I lived in South Africa for about four years. And at the end of that period, I was about to come move to Denmark with my husband. And I, and I realized that I had this pension money laying around that the company I was working for had made the decision to put it in. And I was just out of curiosity, I was like, should I leave it here? Should I take it back to Denmark? And then I just got a little bit curious. And again, I had never seen where that pension money was going. And I'm a financial you know, person. Um, and then I realized, I, I, op I called them and I asked them, and they, 20% of the money, and I work in clean tech and water, if you haven't noticed uh, or heard, that 20% of the money of my savings was going into oil and gas um, all globally. So I mean, even though it's a South African pension fund, they were investing globally. And that shocked me, because I was saying, I, I, you know, <laughs> you go to bed and you think, I'm such a good person, you know, I'm eating less meat, I'm turning off the lights but $44.1 trillion worth of our collective savings, and 20% of that is a big number, is going into oil and gas, habitually. Again, I didn't even know where that money went. I just sort of gave somebody else the right to it. Um, I think, you know, just not to sort of always talk about pension funds as where do they spend the money, why do they spend it there? Well, because it pays. It consistently oil and gas have paid really well. Um, last year, in 2019, um, there was a record number of 100 million barrels a day sold of oil. 100 million barrels a day. That's is where we are, right there. Um, and that's mostly because of rapidly industrializing countries. They need it. They don't always have renewable energy. They don't have alternatives. They need to grow. India needs to grow. China needs to grow. And those numbers are only looking to increase um, unless, obviously, then you know, we do something about it in terms of policy. Um, and this is the, the three scenarios. If you just continue. As of today, you'll probably get 120 uh, million barrels a day of oil. If there is some stated policies today, we have the Paris Agreement. If people actually maintain those Paris Agreements, we'll still grow, but you know, just not as much. And then obviously there is a sustainable world that I want to talk to you about today, which hopefully uh, will have a dramatic decrease of, um, of oil and gas use. I wanted to say some of these, I mean, again, I work in these areas, and I would like this to be sort of helpful. So if there's anything in this graph, please, there is lots of time. Do stop me. Raise your hand and be like, what does that actually mean? I think probably lots of people are thinking it too. So, um, but I think some of these numbers you've seen, so I, I, I don't expect that you would be surprised. And then on the other hand is, you know, we looked at renewables for maybe 20 years, I think, as a, as a global market. And we're still at 26%. And if you take hydro, which is 16, uh, which is not necessarily always, I would say, the best use of um, well, it is good use of energy, but it does harm the environment. It, it, it uh, decreases fish stocks. It can sometimes uh, impact the communities. So, and that's the largest number, that's 16. So basically, the rest of these guys is just 10. We've done 10% of renewables in 20 years. I mean, that's very little. And why do we care about these numbers? Um, we care because currently, again, we have you know, policy, uh, the Paris Agreement that says that think, you know, if we reach at least one and a half to two degrees, it's still gonna, we're still gonna have climate change, but at least it won't be catastrophic. But if we don't stop at those numbers, and it looks like we're not, um, uh, then 
and eventually we might have some absolutely, I mean, these are sort of worst case scenarios, but we can have some very catastrophic results. And this is some nine uh, climate tipping points. Again, people talk a lot about them, which, which basically, they basically means that with rising global temperatures and there is different sort of variations, it could push parts of the Earth to places, to systems that can have irreversible change. What does that mean? It means that like if, you know, if there is permafrost loss somewhere here in, um, in Russia, it means that the, most, the more the ice melts, the more the CO2 and methane, which are really, really dangerous, uh, flow into the air. That actually has an effect of increasing heat and then makes the ice melt even worse, so that it becomes a vicious cycle that becomes almost unstoppable. It kind of feeds on itself. And these, these tipping points, as they're called, we don't know exactly. We have ideas. I think there's lots of people working even in this room on when those tipping points will arrive. But we, we don't exactly know. So we really need to avoid them. And I think just, um, and I mean, I won't talk about all of them, but I think it's a very scary point to realize that if we keep going as we're going, I think some of these things can have catastrophic events for our globe. Um, and I think on the next slide, I'll go into more about so everybody knows those. I think I, that's also why I went rather fast on them. So then why are pension funds still investing in fossil fuels? Everybody knows the scary scenarios and is worried about it, even stressed out about it. And I wanted to tell you a little bit about what I do every day, which I think a lot of other investors and pension funds do as well. Um, every day, I would like you to focus on, this, on the bottom part of this graph. I look at a project, let's say a wind farm in Vietnam, which I'm actually doing, and I think, is this project built? Is the legal environmental risk uh, high or low in this country? And I go and evaluate every day what their risk is. Here is high and here is low. This has a lot to do with the project life, but it has a lot to do with how much the government and the policy um, <coughs> uh, environment is conducive to that project. And I want you to, for, uh, to think that, again, most pension funds in the world look at this graph and they think of renewables somewhere here. They're like, we don't know. We don't have a lot of data. Do they work? Are they actually bringing us money back? And then they look at this graph. The second graph basically says the higher the risk, the lesser the value of, a, of a, any project or any investment, oil and gas, renewables, banks, pharmaceuticals, um, entrepreneurs, you know, they look at this and they say, ah, oh, they don't have so much value, but they have potential because the mo moment I invest here and then the time passes and these guys really show up, then the value of those projects really increase. So as asset matures or a, an investment matures, the perceived risk decreases and the value increases. Now, if you think about this graph in oil and gas, most people are here in oil and gas. They know it. They know that there's some risk. You know, it's not zero, but they know those risks. They can dimension them. They can, they can have millions of data points of references, and they know the values. It's very high. Look at the values of oil. And we're sitting somewhere here. So we're basically saying to pension funds, you guys need to move here. And they're saying, well, the renewable energy or climate-friendly investments have to move there. They're still perceived as risky, less so in the mature markets. I think that's changing. Um, but I just wanted to say before we make them into the bad guys, I think it's important to understand that for them, I think new investments, just like everybody else, you go do something new, you're always going to think it's going to be a little bit risky. The first time you jump off a cliff, you don't know if there are rocks downstairs. You don't know. I mean, at the bottom of the sea, you're you know it's perceived as risky. The next time you do it, it's probably going to be less risky and less. So it, it does have, there is a lot of risk perception in the market. Um, I think it's, again, the other important part to remember is that pension funds are not creative necessarily. All they have to do is give money back to me at the end of the 20 years. I, I give them 100. They need to give me 120 because of inflation, et cetera, or even more, put, hopefully, in order to give so that I can live a good life in old age. That's all. They don't have, they don't think, is the globe going to survive? Is going to, I mean, and by fiduciary duty, is this a, a, a very fancy name for saying they're legally bound to do this. They actually could go to jail if, they, if somebody could go and say, you guys are not maximizing profits for your uh, members. Um, and they invest just to generate return. This is a very narrow, this is all they do. They don't, again, they might be people that look at the newspapers, but their everyday job, their mandate is to just generate return to pensions. And we should be glad. I mean, you, you want to retire and have some money. You don't want somebody to say, well, I thought that that was kind of a cool idea, so, but sorry, we didn't make money. I mean, obviously, I think that would also not be good for us as pensioners. 
And then the other part is knowledge, as I was saying. There's lots of data points in fossil fuel investments, not so much yet, although that's growing. And I think this is also a return back. A lot of them already have money in oil and gas. So the moment you say, what are you doing? They're not going to just take the money out because then they have to, again, then they will lose the money. Or they will have ha actually had a loss. So again, it goes back to the generating return. It's also hard for them to stop because they've already have so much investments. They've already spent billions and billions and trillions of dollars in oil and gas. So it's also very difficult for them to have it stop. Um, so when do you actually say enough um, is enough? And then I think, um, you know, they also have a perception that, re that renewables for you know whether it's right or not but it is a perception that renewables don't often bring returns um, this is a study done by an inv investment partners they asked investors pension funds and others if they believe responsible investing reduces investment returns this is done in 2020 in January so just a few the, the study came just now 52% of global investors believe that investing in non fossil fuels reduces returns. 52. In Germany, that's 80. In Italy, 75. Netherlands is progressive, 71. I mean, whether this is true or not, it doesn't matter. These are people whose job it is to give money back to us, and they perceive that investing in non-fossil fuels, or what we call ESG, environmental, social, and governance, another terminology, reduces returns. Um, and to make things more complicated, I understand them. I don't even know what ESG means sometimes. We have so many terminology. We don't even, n don't even have a definition for what non-fossil fuel investments are, let alone whether they give good returns always. Or um, We just are still in this very mushy, do-gooder, want-to-do-good environment where we haven't even defined from strictly what that actually means. Um, and that, I think, is also uh, the next slide talks about, well, why? Why don't they? Why don't they want to? What, what do they see as challenges? And 51% of them say that there's a lack of quality of ESG data. They don't know how to measure it. They don't have enough reference points in the universe to know that that actually is or is not true. People are working on it. There's been a Harvard Business Review that said that you know, over a three-year period, which is you know, not so much. Usually, they look, like to look at 30. Um, but still, it's a data point. The highest ESG ratings companies outperform the lowest rated firms by as much as 40%. That's a huge difference, so that's really positive. Uh, Merrill Lynch did another study, um, and they said that, again, over three year returns, stocks that had ESG were more likely to become high quality, were less likely to have large price declines, and were less likely to go bankrupt. Another very good data point. So we're moving that direction. Um, but I think another part that I think this is why I think this might now become more interesting for all of us in this room is that pension funds have that perception and there is some right to it, but they also don't have a push. I mean, if you did every day something that works where you say, let's say you run every day and you say, this is great for me, or you eat vegetables, not meat, and somebody comes and says, why don't, running is not so good, it actually hurts your knees, you should probably consider yoga, and you're like, leave me alone, I, I'm doing fine. I'm, I, I'm, I'm living, I, I'm happy. And these guys, I mean, although they know the world that we're living in and they know the climate change, they're also saying, we've done this, it's working really well, they make huge returns on oil and gas. And I think, I love this quote from uh, a British, uh, the largest British uh, pension manager and said, we can't divest from fossil fuels unless you tell us. It's a decision, it goes back to the thing, it's a decision. If you want us to get into a new habit, and that will take some risk, we might even lose some of the money you know, because it's a new area, but you have to tell us. And I think this is an important part of the discussion I want to leave you today. How do we create new habits for pension funds globally to go into areas which are a little bit more risky? Let's just admit that because they're still unknown uh, or lesser known, uh, but we also have to push them in that direction, both from a regulatory perspective, but also from our savings. Um, and I think this is also a very nice quote. It is just a stricture of limitation of thinking often. Um, so now the good news. So I think there was a little bit of a scary point. Uh, I don't know if everybody could see, it's not a great picture, uh, but just like there's negative tipping points, there's also positive tipping points. I don't know if you could see, this is Fifth Avenue in New York in uh, 1900s. Oh, 1900s, that's right. Can anybody see the only car? I've helped you, it's not a good picture, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> 
Um, but there's only one car and everything else is carts and horses. Um, only 13 years later, 1913, same Fifth Avenue, where's the last cart and horse? All you see is cars. It's over there. Um, and I think the, the nice story that I, I loved about, I mean, again, the pictures are a bit grindy, so it's not great. But what, there is also a positive tipping point now happening. Uh, and there are, um, and technology sometimes has that um, effect that you may take, I don't know, 50, maybe even 100 years to create the first combustion engine to drive a car. But once it's on the market and it does make sense, then the change can actually happen very, very fast and in a positive way. And I think that kind of gives me um, a lot of hope. And I think other markets where this has happened and it goes back again to to financiers and investors and capital flight is Nokia. When they came up with a cell phone, it took Nokia only 1% of the market of telephones. So there's telephones, everybody at, at some point in time, I don't know, maybe 80s, had everybody had a telephone at home in the office. Nokia had to sell only 1% of that market share cell phones before they took over and they became 100. And that also happened very fast, It only 1%. And then everybody didn't want to lose out. All investors were also just humans and have herd mentality and we're like, oh no, this is happening, the change. Everybody moved to Nokia. You rarely see telephones except that, you know, when they're fashionable and cute uh, these days in offices and, and, um, and homes. So again, I think, and there's other, um, other in, uh, um, sectors of the economy where that has happened. And that's also positive. It doesn't take that much. It takes 1%, it takes four. Um, in renewables, we're seeing, as I, as I pointed out to you before, it was now it's about 10 um, and and again it is happening I think a lot of the um, a lot of a lot of investors are absolutely moving and I think 2020 is going to be the year they are moving very very aggressively into non-fossil fuel investments um, so what to do I still think policy is key I'm, I don't want to you know sound very American and say just let the markets uh, do their thing uh, I think carbon pricing, I think readjust, re helping re uh, industries uh, like oil and gas that do employ a lot of people and that do in have a lot of our savings in their balance sheets readjust. I don't think, I really think I get very annoyed actually when people say oil and gas, the bad guys, they're evil. They're not evil. They employ people. They employ our investments and for a long time they've made good returns to people so they can live a good life. I think they just need help, uh, I think either through the right policies and as well as through some kind of readaptation. Um, and a lot of them are moving. You see Total has a, a renewable, uh, you see Shell, even Maersk here oil is doing a lot of renewables. And then I think the other thing is follow the money. Like, I think it's that simple. I think habitually people have to figure out where does their pension funds go. It is a huge amount of money. And if we got a little bit more involved in just figuring out who is investing, whether they're good at it, even calling, and then obviously be a conscious consumer, but I think there are lots of people talking about that. I found a really an amazing, I, I, I don't know if this presentation will be um, shared, an amazing article at The Guardian on how to divest pension funds and steps and arguments to call your pension fund and say, what are you doing? I'm just curious. What's your plan? Um, I know I'm you know, a small member, but I think just like with everything else, it starts with, with small members and ask them, ask them what, what's their plan to divest from fossil fuels? What's their plan to move? How are they thinking about risk? Uh, I know everybody's busy, but I think following the money is probably one of the most powerful things that we could do in our everyday, in our everyday lives. Um, thank you, and please, any questions? <laughs>